Okay. Yes. So um, I wanted to thank you guys for coming to my talk right after lunch. Um, as Chris said, I'll be talking about anti-fouling coatings used here on vessels here in California. Sorry, lost. <laughs> so I just wanted to start with a um, introductory slide on biofouling. I know we talked um, this morning a little bit about, but oh, Chris talked about biofouling, but um, just to um, kind of reiterate. Um, Biofouling is a well-known uh, vector uh, for non-indigenous species introductions, uh, but it's not until recently that it has been becoming the, uh, the focus of regulatory actions. And uh, there is a study that estimated that biofouling um, is responsible for up to 60% of currently established non-indigenous species just here in California. So we can see that it's a um, important vector that we need to manage in order to prevent those species um, introductions. So luckily there is an economic incentive to uh, manage biofouling and um, that incentive, as Chris mentioned this morning, uh, is due to the fact that as biofouling accumulates on, the, uh, on vessels, um, it um, produces drag, and um, as, as the vessel is moving through the water, it produces drag, which uh, in turn um, requires uh, more fuel to run the vessel, and that of course costs money. So I wanted to give you an idea of what a um, foul hole looks like and a clean hole, so the, the difference is quite drastic. And also just wanted to point out or clarify that the economic incentive is often for the areas that are um, the, the smooth surfaces of the vessel where um, the, when the, the vessel is moving through the water it experiences drag that doesn't necessarily include some of the niche areas where um, they don't create drag when the vessel is moving. So a preventive way to deal with um, vessel biofouling is through the use of anti-fouling coatings and that is what I'm going to focus mainly on for the rest of my talk. So I just wanted to give you an idea of how many different um, anti-fouling coatings we have been seeing here in California. Uh, we talked about ballast water this morning and that's why I decided to use this example. The last time I checked there were about 57 um, IMO type approved ballast water treatment systems um, and in contrast to this uh, we see uh, we've seen 377 different anti-fouling coatings uh, being used on vessels that arrived here in California since 2008 when we started collecting um, data on those coatings and you can see the numbers are quite different. Of course, they're for different things, but just kind of a comparison of how, um, how many more coatings we have. So you might ask yourself, why do we see so many different um, anti-fouling coating products on the market? And um, there was a study by Davidson et al. that it came out recently that um, looks at the factors that influence that, um, the development of those biofouling management strategies. And um, one of the main factors that influences the development of um, uh, the diverse anti-fouling coatings is the fact that there are a lot of different um, vessel types. And all of those uh, vessel types have different operational profiles. And what I mean by operational profile is uh, vessels, the, the vessel speed, the the schedule at which they get laid up, the, the length of the layup. So, um, of course, there are vessels that move slow and then some that move at faster speeds. Um, and it is very important for the vessel owner and operator to um, consider different coatings and uh, make sure they select the correct one that uh, matches with their operational profile. Um, because, for example, if they mismatch the operational profile with the um, coding, uh, the, the coding um, description by the manufacturer, then that could cause um, 
by a falling to accumulate and then therefore it increases the risk of non-indigenous species introduction. And uh, for example, if we have a vessel that generally moves at slowest speeds, but the coating that is applied on it is uh, for vessels that move at fast speeds, then there is a mismatch there and we wouldn't expect that coating to, um, uh, to perform and um, probably there will be some biofouling accumulation on that vessel. So I kind of, uh, before I started my uh, data section, I wanted to give you an idea of how we collect our data, um, and that is through our co-husbandry reporting form. That is an 11 question form um, that we collect here in California, uh, and, and it's submitted to us annually. Some of the questions that my data is uh, focused on are um, the type of um, coatings that are applied on the vessel. We also ask for the date of application and also the areas um, where that coating is applied. Um, and then also wanted to point out that this form is currently submitted to us 60 days after the commission requests it from um, a vessel that has arrived. And what um, that is, is basically when we verify that a vessel has arrived, we send the agent a notice that we now uh, require that form and um, they have 60 days from the receival of that notice to submit the form. We're currently working on a regulatory package that would start requiring the form 24 hours in advance and that is going to allow us to um, assess the risk um, of the vessel before it comes into California and uh, that would hopefully um, prevent some introduction. So um, just a, a, a brief graph here to show you the submission compliance of the whole husbandry reporting form. On this graph right here, I have the, the years on the x-axis and the number, the number of forms on the y-axis. Um, and then I also have the total um, whole husbandry submission in the gray bars and the unique vessels in those red diamonds. And from those, I was able to calculate the percent compliance those are the percentages there. As you can see, it has been um, going up since we first started uh, collecting the data in 2008. And uh, it was the highest we've reported in the last year. Maybe this year it's going to be even higher. Um, and I wanted to point out that 2008 was um, slightly lower at 72%, but that again is probably due to the fact that that's the first year that we started uh, collecting the form. Um, and also that, that shows you that we have a, a pretty good data set that um, can inform us on those anti-falling coatings and uh, many other aspects of the whole husbandry um, practices of vessels. So from here we go to more graphs as Chris Brown likes to call, call it a uh, death by bar graph, so please stay with me. <laughs> So I mentioned that on the, the Hill Husband reporting form, uh, we collect the date of the coatings application. And we also have the form, when the, uh, the date when the form was submitted to us. So from those two dates, we can, uh, we can calculate the, code, the coding age. Um, and it, it, it's important to know the age of the coding because there are studies that um, say that an old, older coding gets less effective it is. So ideally what we wanna see is that we see younger coatings here um, that we see here in California. And that is in fact what we have here. I took the data from 2008 to 2015 and averaged it because um, the trends were pretty similar. And you can see on the X axis, I have the different um, coding age ranges. So younger than one year, um, I mean, between a year and two years and so on. And then the average percent of vessels that have um, that coding. And the, um, the black bars right here indicate the annual variation. So that shows you that pretty much every year we get codings that are um, of younger age. In fact, we have about, um, on average, 35% of vessels have codings that are um, less than a year old and then 63% have uh, codings 
if we combine those two bars, we get 63% uh, coatings that are less than two years old. So we would expect those coatings to be pretty effective, of course, if uh, applied appropriately and um, uh, maintained properly. And now to go on to what my um, title was, anti the actual anti-fouling coatings that we see, the types, and we have, um, again, the different years on the x-axis, percentage of vessels on the y-axis, just to kind of orient you in the graph. There are two main um, anti-fouling coatings, um, coating types that we see, and those are biocidal coatings. Those coatings use heavy metals uh, to um, to deter organisms to settling in the first place. And then we also have uh, power release coatings. Those organisms uh, allow attachment, uh, those, I'm sorry, those coatings of, uh, allow attachment of organisms, but as the vessel starts moving and uh, reaches the appropriate um, water velocity, those organisms can then detach. Um, the power release coatings are mainly uh, silicon based. So as you can see from the graph right here, we've been seeing a pretty consistent um, um, trend that we see most, most of the coatings being uh, biocidal, about 87% um, on average are, um, are biocidal. Um, the last two years, we see a little bit of a higher trend, like those are about 91%. Um, and I'm not sure what is driving that, but that's what we see. And then there is the, the far release coatings that are red are about 3%, and that has been staying pretty consistent. We had a little bit of a higher percentage in 2008, but then after that it stayed at pretty much 3%. And I just wanted to point out here that we also have a category that's like the far release and biocidal coatings. Um, so that combination of the two types of coatings is sometimes sometimes used by uh, vessels. Um, they generally tend to apply power release coatings on the smooth um, areas of their vessels where um, they would be most effective because when the vessel is moving through the water, those organisms can then detach. But then um, biocidal coatings in their niche areas because uh, niche areas often experience uh, variable um, water flow velocity, so they wouldn't be able to perform as well with power release coatings, or power release coatings wouldn't be able to perform well in niche areas. So 